So next, um, we're going to look at the Agnaths uh, primarily, um, but we're going to be talking about the evolution of a jaw. Right. So, and that, and that all begins kind of with this group, um, the Agnatha. Or the jawless fish. Uh, so there are um, two sort of subgroups within the agnaths. Uh, there's a group called the hagfish and lamprey. So the uh, the hagfish are um, completely marine and scavengers. And the lamprey um, have a variety of different uh, feeding strategies, and they can be uh, found in fresh water as well. So they can be marine, uh, they're estuarine and uh, fresh. So FW for fresh water. Uh, and they can be parasites. Though not all are parasites, some are filter feeders. An interesting thing about uh, members of this group is that um, some of them, as they develop, their sort of larval stage looks almost exactly like the amphioxus of the previous subphyla. So if we look at the, the subphyla cephalochordata, and what does an adult organism look like? And we compare that to the larval form of some of these organisms, they, they're incredibly similar. It's really difficult uh, to sometimes just tell the, dif the difference by looking at them. Um, quickly and even if you look in detail the some many of the, the features are, are there that are that are very similar between them so that's kind of an interesting steps you know of uh, the relationship so <clears throat> this particular group has uh, no no paired appendages though they may have uh, a dorsal fin here uh, they do have a, a, a cranium, but often lack vertebrae. So they're going to have a cranium, but they still have the notochord. No vertebrae. So that's kind of unique. You know, they're, we're talking about vertebrates. We're talking about a group that doesn't have the, the vertebrae. Um, as, as an example. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the things about this group is that uh, they have now these structures, and this is kind of where we're, we're going uh, with this. Is, well, before we get into the whole jaw structure, we'll talk about, you know, they're feeding. Uh, feeding is scavengers and parasites. So they have a, a mouth with usually keratinized teeth for rasping sort of scraping uh, and causing damage to tissue. So if they're scavengers, they're kind of just scraping away at the tissue um, of a, a dead organism. They often like twist their bodies around and they can kind of work it away, um, kind of filing it down sort of um, and, and getting at the tissue. Some of the ones that are parasites kind of damage the, the host tissue and then uh, are essentially get something from their, their blood, you know, as the, the they're attached to the organism, like a leech, you know, but they're... Uh, um, a vertebrate, you know, animal doing that. So they don't have a jaw. Right? They don't have an ability to bite or tear uh, or chew up anything. So they have to be eating, you know, smaller particles like filter feeders or broken down material that they can um, accomplish through whatever they can they can with this sort of rasping, suction cup like mouth part. So that's what we have here in this particular example. This is representing the, the agnath, or jawless fish. Um, Structure-wise, get my <clears throat> pink one here. So in all these drawings here, sort of as a comparison, this structure here is going to be the cranium. And this is going to be the orbit, so opening for, for an eye, just to kind of have as a comparison between them. Now, there's a structure that uh, all these organisms share here uh, and in my drawings, um, and these are called gill arches. Uh, 
and most of these groups here, they are cartilage. And this organ, and this group also doesn't really have bone. Uh, even its um, cranium is of a, a cartilaginous uh, skull. The gill arches are structures that support the gill slits. So that's what we have here. <clears throat> These structures here are representing the gill slits. So we have openings in the animal to the pharyngeal gill slits. So it's used in respiration and uh, the this bony, which is again cartilage, uh, gill arch structure provides support for them. And there are a number of these structures. The numbers are going to be important mostly as we do sort of a comparison. Right? <clears throat> now, then that's it kind of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, that's it for this particular group. They, uh, that all that we're going to really get into. So what we're going to be focused on now is sort of the, the evolution of a jaw. And the idea here is there are multiple ideas or hypotheses. Uh, several of them have been a lot more um, accepted more recently based on you know, morphological, developmental, fossil record, um, molecular evidence, all the, these sorts of things showing that uh, this next group kind of that we're kind of bringing here, these would be the placoderms. these armor plated uh, fish uh, that they are really, you know, show the development of the jaw structure that we see in all the rest of the nathostomes. And that's, those are the vertebrates with the jaw. So um, chordata, and we're going to say nathostomata means jawed organisms. So the organisms, the vertebrates that have a jaw uh, belong to the nathostome. So, you know, everything from amphibians, the, the fish with jaws, mammals, birds, everything, they're all jawed uh, vertebrates. So we kind of have a, a cranium, vertebra generally, and then a jaw kind of is our next, next sort of step along that path. And that's why we're focusing on that here. So what do we see? Where the jaw come from? Uh, and most of the hypotheses show it, although some, some show it coming from other st structures, but most of them show it coming from these gill arch structures. And so we can see here in the placoderms, the gill arch uh, number one and two are gone, but the number three kind of gill arch has kind of been really greatly expanded. So it's kind of the idea is that this gill arch here is, is kind of made bigger and bigger you know, and bigger to the point where this is, you know, this is what would be the, the gill arch. But now they're starting to form a jaw structure. So the upper jaw that typically fuses with the cranium, so keep that in mind, is the maxilla. It typically doesn't move, like I said, because it, it does, it, actually, it fuses with the cranium. The lower jaw, the mandible, And then there's <clears throat> generally a hinge. So musculature allows the mandible to open and close. So these organisms can then also develop. You can see in my little drawing here, they're showing that they have teeth um, developing from a slightly different way um, than our teeth. We'll talk about tooth development uh, as well later on. Um, but they have teeth developing, they're inside the mouth, so they can actually bite you know, organisms. Now, some people think like, you know, how they go from then nothing to this, and that they're still intermediate in a form. So with the expansion of some of these structures, it would allow then a mouth to go from just a suction cup with sort of grinding teeth-like structures to something that could potentially scoop a prey, or maybe prey or some other type of organisms and, and to get uh, food in a different way, a different sort of feeding strategy. And that might be selected for but maybe because they can get more food, you know, say than a filter feeder or, or the scavenger could. And so that would be preferential. They can invest more into reproduction. They pass on those traits more. And then some of them have better structures, better muscle um, connections to them, more developed jaw structures, and then continues along. The idea you have to, you have to remember here is that um, 
Evolution is going to proceed based on success. All right, so again, survival of the fittest. Go all the way back to the beginning of the class. Fittest in terms of fitness in biology means reproductive output. So how much, how many offspring you can have. So that's, that's success in mating, but also the numbers that you can have. And that often requires a lot of energy. And so feeding and feeding strategies are often going to be tied to reproduction because if you're successful at getting food, you can get a lot of food. You can get a lot of energy to store and put into reproduction and reproductive output. If you don't and you're starving, there's nothing much that can go toward that. And we see that in a whole bunch of different ways in different organisms. I even talked about that recently with uh, echinoderms and sort of the, the development of their gonads versus their pyloric cica how the pyloric cica stores the nutrients and then it usually disappears as the gonads develop uh, and they kind of go back and forth as a flock. So this nutrient storage is closely tied to reproductive output. The more reproductive output you have, the genes go into the next generation and so those characteristics then get passed on and, and the populations and then and so forth. So you start to see those traits, whatever those organisms had that were more successful more and more frequently in the next generation. That then changes allele frequencies, again, going back to the beginning of the course, and we start to see you know, more permanent basis of change uh, in populations until we get new species you know, of organisms eventually emerging. So that's kind of the idea, you know, what's going on here, that the organisms are developing uh, these gill arches into jaw-like structures, maxilla and mandibles, and then those structures uh, continue along to become a little more complex. So now we see uh, the gill arches three and four down here. And this in this example, this would be typically all the, the jawed fish. Um, but I'm using here just a chondrichthys. So this is just a cartilaginous fish um, as the example, which you don't have to worry about that, that particular name. Uh, or we'll talk a little bit about that later when we talk about bones. Um, but so bony fish, the jawed fish, the lung fish, all the different groups of fish that we're going to talk about all will have sort of the similar um, development uh, ancestry sort of of the jaw structure and we can see once again still one and two are still missing but now three and four so there's more structures that incorporated so kind of three let's give it a code here uh, with a, a color so three being say this part here and then four kind of joining in to add you know adding to this you know, additional bones um, that are part of the, the jaw. So the jaw is actually composed of you know, multiple different uh, bones kind of all fused together. Some of them fused together in the upper part and some of them fused together in the, the mandible. And then we still have the gill arches and we still have the gill slits. Um, still have sharks, you know, still have a, so sort of a flap on the side that supports um, water flowing over their gills. That's why a lot of times you see a shark swimming around with their mouth open. It's not to be scary. Uh, it's because they, they bring water through their mouth and the water passes over their gills and usually then it passes back out, you know, through these slits uh, in the side. But in this case, the, the more well-developed bone, the more places there are attachment for muscle. So you get additional muscular development in these organisms, which means they can bite and chew uh, Either more food in terms of say, volume, they could eat larger prey so they can potentially get more energy, you know, from that. Um, and so we see that kind of shifting as well to more predatory uh, feeding strategies from more passive filter feeding or scavenging uh, feeding strategies. So the evolution of the jaw um, with it brings more types of predation uh, in the vertebrates uh, and uh, greater success in terms of uh, obtaining nutrients that they can invest in reproduction. So the key things to take away here, in ter the terms are uh, these cartilaginous structures that support the gills are, are called the gill arches. Right? And we find those all the way through from the agnaths to the placoderms to all the different types of um, cartilaginous and bony fish. And then what we see is that as we go to the placoderms, and then into the, uh, the other types of fish. Um, some of the gill arches disappear, but others seem to be expanded upon and rearranged. Uh, some of them partially fuse with the cranium, and then others become, uh, through a joint, a hinged lower mandible. All right? And so they can then 
open and close the mouth and then potentially develop different types of teeth. As we talk about sharks, for example, their teeth are derived from scales, actually. So they're not uh, developing from uh, bone or anything like that. They don't have bone. They're all, they're all cartilage. Their whole body is cartilage. Um, so kind of keep those things in mind. Uh, mandible, lower jaw, maxilla, upper jaw. Uh, and that's kind of the jaw evolution part. And so we're talking about nathostomes, the groups of animals with a jaw. This is where their jaw came from. And there's been a lot of recent evidence that shows, yes, that sort of all the organisms with a jaw and ours can be linked back to really placoderm uh, ancestors who start, started this developmental process. Um, jawless fish, so who don't have the jaw, this is the only time we're really going to talk about them. So I'm just bringing up a few things uh, about that particular group. So that particular group is also called the agnaths. They're the hagfish and the lamprey. Hagfish also are typically uh, blind. They, they don't really have um, very well-developed eyes, um, but the lamprey do have a little bit more well-developed eyes. Um, none of them have paired appendages. They have cartilaginous skeletons, and they have the notochord, remember, not vertebra. So that, that's for really all of them, to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, and that's going to be kind of it for this, the, the jaw uh, development and some of the key features there. Uh, the next thing we'll look at is uh, as some of these organisms go between cartilage and bone, that's going to be the next thing to really look at. There's a question of how does bone develop uh, in animals uh, and then vertebrate animals. And so we're going to look at uh, different strategies of bone development. Um, and then that'll kind of lead us into the sort of the skeletal system.